All right, good evening, guys. Um, we're going to pick up again from where we left off after the French-Indian War, and we're going to focus a little bit on the end of salutary neglect and British actions against the colonists that will result in American frustration and eventually revolution. So uh, just before we get going, we're going to reference King George III quite a bit. Um, George III ruled basically from 1760 to 1820. Um, he actually ascended the throne. He was 22 years old, I believe. Um, and his predecessors, George I and II, they've been largely content with allowing Parliament to handle government and also handle the actions that's going on in the colonies. But King George III, being young and not quite bright yet, um, is going to try to establish himself. And uh, he distrusted Parliament. And uh, he was determined to have a strong influence on government policy. But he did wish to reign as a constitutional monarch who did cooperate. Um, but his experience and his temperament um, really suited him for the task. So when, when we get to King George III and we reference him quite a bit, I understand he's a young person trying to make his, his way in government and make his name for himself. Now, we left off talking about the end of the war, and um, I want to focus briefly on Pontiac's Rebellion. And, um, you know, as, as tensions mattered among the Great Lakes and uh, the Ohio Valley Indians especially, um, there's a Delaware religious prophet called Neolin, and he actually attracted a ton of followers calling for this, this complete repudiation uh, by Indians of European culture. That means, you know, getting rid of alliances, material goods and stuff. And, you know, meanwhile, other Native Americans hope the French would return to power so they could once again balance, you know, the British and the French against one another. But uh, political leaders such as Pontiac, who was an, an Ottawa Indian, um, drew on these sentiments and he forged a explicit anti-British movement. And in the summer of uh, 63, in the spring of 63 as well, um, they actually sacked and, and destroyed eight British forts near the Great Lakes and caused some problems with two other ones in Pittsburgh and Detroit. But uh, shortages of food and ammunition and then a smallpox epidemic, which was actually triggered by... Um, deliberately infected blankets at a peace parlay. Isn't that classy? We actually had a peace conference. We'd give them uh, smallpox infested blankets. Um, <laughs> and a recognition that the French would pretty much not return. I mean, they knew they weren't coming back. Um, what did the Indians to surrender? And although the war of the uprising spread to Indians like the southeast and Mississippi, um, the effective diplomacy of uh, such men like British agent John Stewart, um, not from The Daily Show, but uh, prevented violence from erupting in these areas again. Um, but the Indian fears that result from Pontiac's rebellion, here you can see the attacks on this slide as well. Um, but the Indian fears are going to contribute to what we mentioned in class the other day uh, with the backlash of the, uh, the Paxton boys in response to uh, the proclamation line sent out. So King George could act very quickly, as we read yesterday, talking about how we want to create this line for two big reasons. Number one was the security of our colonists, literally, as to quote him. Um, and the second thing was to show the Indians just how just and righteous we were. We were going to no longer have these bogus deals with them and steal land. We were going to show them that we were truly, uh, truly the righteous people. Um, but there were initial restrictions against the colonies. Let's talk a little bit about colonial... Um, colonial taxation and, uh, and, and, and British involvement in taxes as well. In 1651, you got navigate, the Navigation Acts, and um, we talked about those a lot. The Navigation Acts were passed on a number of occasions. Um, these, were, these were regulatory acts and regulatory taxes because they were regulating trade, okay, when they tried to regulate behavior. So they placed high taxes on imports, and that was done solely to serve mercantilism, to serve the idea that you know, we're going to eliminate trade with, with France. We're going to hurt the Dutch and hurt the French and hurt the Spanish. We're only going to protect uh, British trade. Um, things pick up a little bit. You have a molasses tax in 1733, um, a woolen act, which for, for, actually forbade the colonies to export woolen goods, a hat act for hat makers. Um, they couldn't sell hats outside the colonies. Then even an iron act, which restri restricted the manufacturing of iron in the colonies because... Um, of its prevention from getting in the hands of the French, the Dutch, and the Spanish. So 
Again, in all these situations, these were restrictions, but they were rarely enforced. They were only enforced when they had to be. And there's ways to get around them. There was an you know, incredible culture of smuggling um, that took place in America. Now, during the French-Indian War, though, the issue we're going to come across is that smuggling was getting really big during the French-Indian War. So the British government took incredible measures to restrict this. And um, the one things they passed in 1761 are the writs of assistance. Now, since you understand the writs of assistance, you have to look at um, what the intention of the British are really trying to do. Okay, um, basically, the writs of assistance allows um, British officials to board ships, to search in houses, to um, look through any private property in search of smuggled goods. Now, tomorrow we're going to talk a lot about James Otis and his case and the protection of the citizenry, and uh, we're going to look at some of his documents. But you know, he, I mean, he's going to lose this case. However, he's going to set a precedent that our property is precious. And this goes along with what we talked about the other day in class about the Enlightenment, about property laws, and about the right to life, liberty, and property. Now, after James Otis's eloquent defense against the writs of assistance, um, the British are going to pass a series of acts under George Grenville. Um, George Grenville and most of his supporters in Britain, um, they viewed these taxes as a small price for the benefit of the empire. Um, he is going to have some, um, some people who are going to be against these taxes. William Pitt, um, who's well respected in the American colonies, is going to resist this too. Um, Pitt of Jackson, principal of Britain, levying taxes on colonists. You know, um, he you know he basically says the colonists are being taxed by their own colonies. They don't need to be taxed again, and, and that's a huge issue um, in the discussion here between these things. But Greenville, Grenville, and his followers agree with Pitt that Parliament could not tax any British subjects unless they enjoyed representation in that body. But they're going to say that these actual colonists are represented in Parliament, even though they really weren't. And we'll get to that in a second. Um, but the Sugar Act in 1764 is going to be passed, um, you know, and again, you know, Grenville's going to order the Navy to enforce this measure, and it did so very vigorously. Like uh, a Boston resident's going to complain, I'm, I'm, I'm paraphrasing this quote, he's just, but you know, no vessel hardly comes in or goes out, but they find some pretense to seize and detain her. But the Navy is really starting to harp on confiscating ships looking for, uh, looking for um, contraband. So uh, that same year, like even Pennsylvania's chief justice reported that customs officers were extorting fees from small boats for carrying lumber across Delaware to Philadelphia. So again, the Sugar Act's going to alarm colonists by sacrificing their economic interests and legal rights to the benefit of British merchants. You know, um, what, what the Sugar Act is, in, in, in essence, it's very, very simple. Um, it's the first revenue tax. It's an indirect tax on sugar, molasses, and rum, any sugar-based products. So a revenue tax is basically, um, you know, they're going to put the tax on the merchant, but what the merchant's going to do in essence is he's going to raise the prices and it's going to affect you. So this really affects the merchant. And you know, the merchant's going to pay the tax to the British, but he's going to pass it on to the colonists themselves. So it's a well-conceived tax, um, but the guy who's going to suffer is the merchant because he's going to be caught in the middle. He's going to catch hell from the, from the colonists for having these high prices on these goods. Um, and they want to do something about it. So they, they actually, merchants are actually going to boycott. This is the first real boycott. But the problem is um, they're not going to get any help from the colonists on this because the merchants don't have a great uh, mouthpiece to, to voice their cause. They didn't understand the concept. There's a lack of communication. I mean, they didn't have a lot of support from influential people like politicians and ministers and preachers. And the Sugar Act confused a lot of Americans. Um, and again, much like the Molasses Act, it never was meant to be a revenue measure. Um, but they didn't denounce the Sugar Act as unconstitutional because it seemed really only to amend the Molasses Act. Because basically what they were doing, they were getting upset at the merchants because rather than pay for like a three pence tax, Americans continued smuggling molasses. Um, but to discourage smuggling, the British do slap this act on and they actually lowered the tax, made it less, but the law thereafter raised about $30,000 annually in revenue. It raised money for the British. It did. 
Um, you're going to have a currency act that's going to be passed in 1764. We talked about the quartering act that's going to be passed as well, which is very controversial um, in the sense that um, it requires upon demand colonists to have to give food or lodging to British soldiers. And there's more and more soldiers, there's going to be more and more tension, uh, more and more quarrels could create some enemies. Um, and these are going to stay around. The Sugar Act, the Quartering Act, the Writs of Assistance, they're going to be there. And the Quartering Act provides a ton of conflict between the Brits and the colonists. It's incredible friction. It's also going to serve for propaganda. We learn about the Sons of Liberty. Now, the Stamp Act is probably the most controversial. Um, it's a direct tax. Um, it's a tax on legal documents, printed materials, newspapers. It's going to affect a lot of um, influential people. And they're going to be incredibly upset. Um, lawyers, newspaper people, these are the people who actually can speak and carry on messages and pass along information. Um, influential people, when you upset them, they do a very good job of, of, of pitching their cause. So the Stamp Act is going to have some significant effect on the colonists, and they're going to do a great job coming together to protest, which we'll talk about tomorrow. Now, the Brits do feel like they, have, they are justified in, um, in taxing the Americans. We talked about how Grenville basically said that we have a right to tax, that, that the people in the colonies are represented here in Great Britain, even though they really weren't. Um, and this is the idea of virtual representation. Okay? The British are going to claim that they virtually represent all the best in the best interests of all Englishmen, no matter where they are. So th that's a big issue in America because the American colonists are going to say, wait a minute. According to the English Bill of Rights in 1689, you cannot levy taxes, you cannot suspend laws, you cannot change laws without representation, without the consent of the government. And we are not being represented. So the authority. The big question is, what was the extent of Parliament's authority of the colonies? Was it absolute or was it limited? And the Brits are going to say it's absolute because they have virtual representation. So the other question is, how could the colonies give, with, give or withhold consent for parliamentary legislation when they did not have representation in that body? And they don't. And this is that whole concept of taxation without representation. Their rights, they feel, are being deprived based on the English Bill of Rights in 1689. While, back in Great Britain, people like George Grenville, who's constructing all these taxes, which are going to be very helpful in, in, in recovering Britain's debt, he's going to say that we virtually represent the best interest of all colonists. So that's going to cause some issues, okay? And so we'll leave off here the Stamp Act Congress, which is going to create the Loyal Nine, the Sons of Liberty, the Stamp Act Congress. It's going to have a major, major effect, which we'll talk about tomorrow.